My name is Henry Miori, and I'm here to introduce my new book out called Love, Fourth Quarter Redefined Legacy Continues. My dear wife, Mary, of 53 years, is here to uh, help introduce the topic. The question is, Henry, why did you even want to write a book or something like this? Well, the circumstances of May the 13th, I uh, had a big day planned and got out of bed, ended up with the uh, fire department and IMSA here and headed for the emergency room. And Mary, as we both recall, it was a pretty dramatic situation. Our daughter and family was called and it looked like the Lord might be calling me home in a set of circumstances and 10 days in St. Francis, nine, nine days in Methodist Manor got me started and I'm about halfway through a uh, rehab. But Mary, what do you remember about being in that emergency room and all of that taking place? I was just very, it was just very solemn. It was very critical. You were um, short of breath and your body was trembling, and we didn't know what was happening, and we discovered you had a urinary tract infection that had become septic. And so your body was shutting down, your kidneys were shut off completely, and we don't know what happened to the other part of your organs, but we felt that if, if that if your heart was in duress, um, and the IV was not responding, so they had to put a pick line up here by your by your neck so that they could go directly into your blood system so that um, hopefully you'd start reviving. But in those moments, in those critical moments, um, I, we just weren't sure if the Lord wasn't going to call you home. And if it weren't for the fact that I really praise God for our daughter-in-law who's a, a nurse, a charge nurse, and she just, we were rotating family members in and out of the ER and uh, um, she sensed that it was time to have the pick line put in place. And that's when everything turned around. But for those early 15, 20 minutes, we just really weren't sure what was happening to your heart, what was happening to your body. We just knew that your blood pressure was very, very low. And all, you know, uh, all the visible signs were that you, everything was closing down. What I had thought and planned on was the, I kept telling everybody, it's going to be the best summer ever. <laughs> We've gone to Canada and Alaska fishing, and the boys had lined that trip up. Uh, we had a two-year-old birthday party, and, and uh, Henry's plan was that things were going to be perfect, and we right. open the pool, yes, and, that was our plan. and they'll all just work out perfect. But the Lord created a situation that uh, we had to uh, revise the plan. And what I've learned in life is that if Henry sorts out something, I'm right about 75% of the time. If the Lord and the Holy Spirit drives it, then it's 100%. So I thought about uh, Huber's book, Halftime, by Bob Huber, who I had read and thought about. He equates life to uh, the quarters of a football game. And so I had the opportunity to play football in high school and at Eastern Oklahoma State College. I could relate to, and this book talks about each quarter of my life and how it prepared me to overcome this particular difficulty. So Mary and I do our devotionals every day. We study from the Bible. We go to church. We digest sermons and uh, a number of scriptures jumped out at me. Romans 5, 3, 4, we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Our present sufferings are not worth compared with the glory that the joy that the Lord has revealed, Romans 8, 18. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear, but then do not be frightened, Peter 3.13. So what I could 
see then is that uh, in life we're all going to uh, experience difficulty. So how did each of these steps of the first through the fourth quarter of life get me ready? And I'm going to use personal examples, but then try to give the message to people that, uh, like me, unplanned and right out of nowhere, we're going to face difficulties in life. Difficulties in every quarter. But this one is aimed basically to the fourth quarter. You know, what, what do you do when you're 77 years old and and uh, those that are, are reading the book and listening to the tape, it either relates to you, it relates to your parents, someone you're close to, or your grandparents. So for me, it all starts out with parents, uh, Roscoe Channing Miori and Mary Gladys Miori. So I grew up in a nurturing home with uh, two parents, three meals a day, a work ethic. My father went to school 39 days in his life, was incredibly successful, uh, taught me lessons every day. My sister was an inspiration. She was uh, at, a, at a wonderful high school career, I was motivated by her. Every part of life begins a journey. So part of that journey then, as I grew up, is I found a wife, had some kids, and had some grandkids. Now why is that important today? Because the value and the love and the support of your family, uh, every day I rely on. So what I'm hoping is that we all can all look at our past and look at people that have influenced us. So, how has Henry progressed? Well, he started out as a young boy in high school, grew up, became professional, and uh, so here I am today. Again, the influence of growing up in Collinsville and having parents that were active in the church and active doing things and working in the Western Auto Store uh, every day after whatever sports practice I would work at the store. Your father owned it. And the father owned it. So, and then on Saturdays, I would uh, work in the store. So having the discipline of working and contributing to the family helped me understand how important family is. Growing up in Collinsville then, I had an opportunity to uh, compete and play four sports. It was on all conference in football, basketball, and baseball, and won the district 440. So where did all that come about? It wasn't a gift. I had to work every day and be diligent. So when I would go to my father's store and work, I would wear heavy boots knowing that that would strengthen my legs. And instead of riding home in the company truck, I would walk home in the heavy boots to strengthen my legs. Mm. Then right at the corner of our home was uh, a basketball goal. So then I had a regimen of shooting baskets. Then I'd get my baseball glove and throw the baseball against the uh, garage door and feel it. Mm -hmm. And then my friend Clay Lynch would come by and after dinner, we would uh, go throw passes. He was our quarterback. Okay, the day is still not over. So now we would ride our bicycles up to the track and run 100 yard dashes. Hmm. Then get on the bicycles, there were no swimming pools, and ride out to the uh, coal pits and swim. Now, how does that affect Today, it taught me and, and reinforces now that you've got to keep working, training, and drilling if you want to succeed. 
So I did have the opportunity then to go ahead and play sports in college. At age 17, between my junior and senior year in high school, I signed up in the 125th Fighter Interceptor Squadron and went to Lackland Air Force Base. Okay, is that smart to be 17, wake up in the morning at 4.45, drill all day in San Antonio heat? Uh, yes, it toughens you up. So as Henry toughened up today, I think so. Going back to the rigor and the drill that you learn in the service and the discipline created the opportunity when you face difficulty that uh, you know how to overcome it. So getting out of high school then gave me the opportunity to play football and basketball at Eastern. And I went down and, and had an athletic career, made wonderful friends for life. I had the privilege and honor of being in the Athletic Hall of Fame, the Alumni Hall of Fame. Then the last 49 years I've helped sponsor and started the Larry Stone Award, which was a friend of mine killed in Vietnam and one of my teammates. So you learn the lesson of giving. So here I am in the fourth quarter and I need to be thinking about giving and blessing other people. So I went from Eastern then to Oklahoma State University and majored in production management and minored in industrial engineering. And what attracted me to that is from my field, my career in athletics, is managing some kind of a manufacturing facility was like a team. Teams have to win, teams have goals, teams have measurable outcome. And like the teams I had the privilege of playing on and the coaches that I had, the coach's job is to motivate everyone to create a team. So that gave me an exciting opportunity. So I went to Chicago in January of 1963, and uh, my first shock and reality of life is Ray Oxner, the director of our program, had 200 of us in the room, and he said, look around. We hired 200, but we only need 100. And you'll either quit because of the pressure or the difficulties you're going to face, or we're going to say for both our benefits, uh, you just don't fit here. So, like making the teams in athletics, I realized I'm going to have to keep working hard. Here I am at age 77 and I still realize that I need to work hard. So, that summer I meet a beautiful young woman, Mary Bentley, at the Flamingo. And here we are 53 years later. And uh, Mary, what do you remember about our meeting in those early days? Oh, I just remember that we lived, we lived in the same apartment building and I was down on the fourth floor and you were up on the 17th and um, that we met by the swimming pool and we had lots of friends from the building and um, we would do things together and it just was a happy time. It was an idyllic kind of uh, dating situation. We were by the lake. We'd walk along the lakefront and uh, and just do those kinds of things. And if I remember correctly, you had a convertible in those days and we'd ride up and down the shoreline, South Shore and North Shore in the, the car. We had a lovely dating, we had a lovely courtship. Um, and let me add, she was very impressed. I was making $425 a month <laughs> and had a brand new 1963 uh, Candy Red Super Sport. So uh, there was a little bit of attraction there. Um, <laughs> Why is that important today? I would say we've been best friends. We've enjoyed our life together. We've traveled all over the world. And these last two years have been difficult on you, Mary. Mm -hmm. And we've been in and out of the uh, uh, emergency rooms about 10 times and the hospitals half a dozen times, doctor's appointments. So that's just not the perfect way for Mary to 
live her life, but we're dedicated to each other. And I'm hoping that everybody out there has someone they can depend on, or if you know someone that's uh, struggling, that you en encourage and try to stay with them. Henry, I want to interject something. Um, I think uh, when we talk about your struggles and your health issues, we, we came uh, very shortly after the headaches got to be a big problem. But I think we, we came to realize that God had a plan for us. Yes. Well, we know well, we know that this is part of his plan for us. I, I'm convinced of that. Now, was I set for a perfect summer in May? Did I want to go back to Red Lake in Canada and do a fly-in fishing for a week like we did the year before? Yes. Did I want to have a spectacular birthday party? Uh, that grandeur, just wasn't no. Henry's plan. No. So the Lord got Henry's attention and is, has had me redirect my thoughts, mm -hmm. which is this new book coming out. So now, here we go with a career at Continental Can, and I was in charge of manufacturing. Uh, I went from Continental Can, had the privilege to work with Oral Roberts, uh, at age 35 became the dean of the founding dean of the College of Business, our original faculty, and had the excitement of uh, being involved in Oral Roberts' ministry. And then my desire was to be able to develop people, develop students, and let the Holy Spirit use my influence to guide them. I also uh, consulting with Fred Rudge in New York and others found the value of helping organizations succeed, which I found to be a gift. I've gotten 17 books in seven languages, and everything that I have learned I've put into those books about how organizations, churches, and business succeed, and how individuals succeed. And if I hadn't come to ORU, I would have never started publishing and never created the opportunity to help other people. The lifetime of teaching, just an enormous gift to have over 7,000 students in, uh, since 1970 in uh, seven different countries all over the world. Seven of my books are translated, so we've been visiting professor and uh, China and Russia and Mexico and taught at four major universities in Mexico. But the wonderful relationship that we have with all of our students has just been a constant joy and I hear from them on just a regular basis. Uh, Mary, what can you remember about what we seemingly have enjoyed the last summer as people have learned of our difficulty but just hearing from our students. Now it's just been, a, it just, I, I say to you, every, whenever you get down, I say, every day God is sending you uh, a little joy, a, a contact, you get an email, you get a message, um, you're on Facebook, you're Facebook friends with so many of your former students. But it seems like a day does not pass in which God doesn't send you a gift. And even though you're, you're, you have these horrible headaches, and you're dealing with that pain. It, it's just such a, um, it's such a treat to be able to hear from your former students who say such wonderful things. And if we don't run into your students, we run into another ORU student who remembered you, which is what happened the other day. We were at lunch Thursday, and this is Saturday, and someone said, I was a law student. But Dr. Miori, you had such a great influence on your students and how he, I mean, you know, I know compliments are, are, are not to build us up and we can't get a big head, but they can bless us and they can bless others. And so that was so dear of him to just to, to have a remembrance of, of uh, uh, what he remembered from those days. So God is um, comforting you in a way yes. through, these, through these lives that you've touched because they remember and it's, it's incredible how often 
It's just they just coming back into our lives. And those that you've kept friends with, um, you have former colleagues who call you and, and suggest medications and are concerned about you. Yeah, you're, these quiet years in which you are not involved in anything um, commercially or uh, career-wise um, are, are yielding a benefit. I mean, that you're, you're profiting from all the seeds, to use an R. Roberts uh, idea. All the seeds that you planted have come to harvest in your later years. And I wonder if that's not true for all of us. I mean, it's certainly true in your children. I mean, all those years you put into your children, how the harvest comes back to us. I mean, we've just come from enjoying a football game at our son's house, and and we have another son who lives near us, and we have a daughter in North Carolina. And our, we have grandchildren in other states who call us and and uh, ask us for uh, ideas and information. So, yeah, Lauren has just given us so many so many gifts, and we're really reaching a harvest of what we've done in those past years. Yeah. I would like to acknowledge two people of many that have had a great influence on my life, and I've discussed them. Community Spirit Magazine did a story on me called Finishing the Game with Courage, and then uh, Tulsa People Magazine did a story on my legacy. And in both of those columns, I recognize uh, two people, Oral Roberts. I had the privilege of working with him for 17 years, being his dean, starting the business school. I was 35 years old, all the other deans, everybody in academia is older. He took me under his wing. And if he told me once, he told me a hundred times, success isn't success without a successor. Develop other people. So what I've been doing since I've become as getting harder to do things, I have what I call an army of 50. I need help on everything that I do. So I went ahead and, and uh, updated nine of my books, but I've got five other books that are being co-authored with former students. In the last uh, two years, I've had 18 columns and cases that were updated and co-authored with other students and people that I've worked with. So it's given them a chance to contribute and grow. The other person that I talk about in both articles is George Odeorn. So. I'm 27 years old. Continental Can sees some value in me, sends me to the University of Michigan's executive program. Everybody in there is 10, 15, and 20 years older than I am. But George Odeorn saw something in me. It became uh, a helper, wrote the foreword in my books. And a few months before he passed, uh, I stayed in touch with him and went to see him two or three times a year. And uh, I could see that he was frail. I said, Dr. Odeorn, how can I possibly ever repay you? And he said, you can't. You've got to help someone else. So part of my lifelong motivation then has been to help other people, help bless other lives, uh, help churches, ministries, nonprofits. And my motivation now in the fourth quarter is to go ahead and extend the game into overtime and continue to make contributions and do what I can with my energy. Right out of nowhere, last year, the Oklahoma State Senate gave me a certificate of citation uh, awarding me and giving me recognition for contributions to the minority community to uh, entrepreneurship and uh, helping with uh, North Tulsa. This just came out of nowhere, but when I took the professorship at the University Center at Tulsa in 1987, we're right on the edge of North Tulsa, and I knew that uh, we should make a contribution. So we did seminars and helped start 465 minority businesses. So I was asked to be 
part of uh, the current Black Wall Street project. And so here I am, not quite as sharp as I've ever been, but I've been working in that program and, uh, and taking part of my army of 50 as volunteers in. So at age 77, I still want to make a contribution. This is a gift that God has, has given me. Other opportunities that Mary and I have enjoyed, I've been a visiting professor in seven different countries, but we had the opportunity to be a visiting professor at Waiya University in China. Uh, took my strategy book, translated it into Chinese, and once again, we have Chinese students that I stay in touch with, and we published seven major studies, and uh, so I feel a heart toward the Chinese. So when Global Alliance uh, here in Tulsa brings guests in from foreign countries, then we like to help host them. They stay in our homes many times. And then as a gift, we autograph books for them. And in foreign countries, uh, uh, professors and books are just a very, very great honor to be able to autograph a book and take a picture. Our work in Russia, we still host and maintain, and, and uh, I lectured out of uh, Oral Roberts University's Global Alliance Center to a class in Russia and talked about my Russian experiences and how we uh, uh, increased productivity and did work. And I was on Gorbachev's privatization uh, uh, task force with other economists. So I had the chance just a few months ago to, to share with uh, particularly one young woman that just wanted to follow up about my experiences. So it just seems that God wants me to share my life, my experiences for the others, for the benefit of others. So what a journey. And guess what I've learned? The journey isn't over. We're going to play into the overtime. And uh, what an exciting life it's been. And uh, the opportunity to live life to its fullest, have a family, and uh, all of life experiences has contributed to, and we'll finish this book up, that the legacy lives on. So what I'm inspired to do, uh, in spite of failing health, is to keep all my initiatives going be thankful to my dear wife and family for their continued support. And uh, Mary, thank you for 53 wonderful years and everything you go through. And are you ready for the thank end you. of the fourth quarter thank and the you overtime? Thank you for 53 wonderful years yeah. yourself. Um, you know, dear, yes, I am excited about what the Lord has for us in our future. I uh, I know you have always said we're at the fourth quarter. I, I'm I'm happy to hear that you think we're into overtime. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm just rejoicing that we have enough ability to be able to give back. And we're yeah. just waiting for the Lord. We're looking at a new opportunity to start volunteering in our community schools together. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to the books uh, that are coming forth because the people have sponsored them. And uh, where those books will go and the lives that they'll touch and change and bless for the kingdom. So I think we have a lot to look forward to and a lot to be grateful for. We have a new grandson coming in yes. two and a half months. So um, if this is over time, I'm, I'm grateful for it. So in conclusion, what message that I hope comes from the book and from us is uh, be grateful for your family, which I acknowledge growing up in Collinsville. Be grateful for the family you have now, our wonderful family and children and grandchildren. Everything that you learn in life, every person that crossed your path got you ready so that when you face difficulty and you're in the emergency room, you don't give up and you just keep going. How would I like to be as strong as I was in the early days? Yes, I ran a 52, 3, 440 in 1958, but 
I'm grateful that I can walk around the neighborhood. So, great experience. So I just encourage everyone to trust the Lord. The Lord directs our steps. Just be bold. single dream I lay each one down at your feet every moment of my wandering never changes what you see I've tried to win this war I confess my hands are weary I need Tomorrow 